Bless the Lord. Yeah. I um I believe I'm ready. Uh wait just give me a thumbs up there, man. They I don't know when to go. You gotta get give me a signal. Oh yeah? Good. We will. Oh, okay. It's good to know. Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Bless the Lord. Well, look, I might not be too long tonight. Y'all haven't heard that since last year, right? I said that two weeks ago. Oh, well. Uh, and look, he called those things that be not as though they were. I keep on saying that we, we might get out of here quick. Exodus, I want to talk about the boards. I've still been talking about this frame on the structure of the tabernacle. And this structural frame, every bit of this tabernacle is talking about Jesus. And we've been looking at it and as much as we can. Exodus 26, let's start there. Le we we talked about so far on this boards. I talked about. Uh, I started off with the boards. I talked about th their material. Uh, I talked about their dimensions, uh, two, and I talked about the sockets, three, and I talked about their meaning, four. I think we're going to continue to talk about their distribution tonight. The distribution is five, the couplings and the bars is seven. So I'm going to talk about, maybe I can finish that tonight. Exodus 26, let's talk about how they were distributed throughout this uh, tabernacle. Exodus 26, look at verse 18. And thou shalt make the boards for the tabernacle 20 boards on the south side, southward, right? Uh, verse 20. And for the second side of the tabernacle, on the north side, there shall be 20 boards. So we had 20 boards on the north side, south side, and 20 boards on the south side, north side, and 20 on the south side, right? North side and, and south side, we had 20 boards each, right? And... Verse 22, and for the sides of the tabernacle westward, thou shalt make six boards. So that's the back of it, really, because you go in from east to west. West is where the holiest of holies is. So you're going in the tabernacle from the east to the west. So he says on the back side or the west side, thou shalt make six boards. Londo, make sure the meters are going up uh, enough on the switcher, on the on the switcher, so that you give me enough volume on the switcher. Make sure the volume is going up high enough for me, because sometimes it it lingers down in the green. Make it go up to the yellow, at least. Okay, now uh, verse twenty-two, it says six boards on the back side, right? Verse 23, and two boards shall thou make for the, watch this, two boards shall thou make for the corners of the tabernacle in the two sides. So in the two back sides of this tabernacle, you got two boards in the corners. You see that? Two boards shall thou make for the corners of the tabernacle in two sides. In, in the two sides, on on the sides of it. That's pretty interesting because now he says, make two boards for the corners of the tabernacle at the rear on both sides. Now, verse, watch this, verse 25, and they shall be eight boards and their sockets of silver, 16 sockets. Watch this, two sockets under one board, 
and two sockets under another board. You notice the dominant number here. We've been the most prominent number we've been keep saying is two. Two, two, two. Two you notice two is very prominent here in what we've been reading tonight. You know, is it keeps talking about the two uh a lot. You know, verse you know, we see the uh two sides, you know, we see um the two sides of the corners. Um, also, uh, we see uh, the, the second side of the tabernacle. I mean, we see two pretty in verse uh, 22 and 23. We see the two sides. In verse 25, we see uh, we see two sockets, two sockets. You know, we see two a lot. So. Two is a prominent number here. And it's interesting because two, scripturally, the number two uh, means several things. Uh, we say that two means agreement, right? Scripture says uh, agreement, right? Now, Matthew 18, verse 19, I'll come back here. Go, go with me to Matthew 18. Hello, everybody. Matthew 18, verse 19. Listen at what, what Jesus says. He says, Again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done of them for my Father, which is in heaven, right? So we say, if two of you shall agree. That's why they say two means agreement. Uh, also, it, it, it means agreement. Also, it means witness or testimony. So two means testimony. It means agreement. And it means witness. Go with me to 2 Corinthians 13. I'll show you something else while, before I get off this. 2 Corinthians 13. Look at verse 1. Second Corinthians thirteen. Let me know when you're there. Second Corinthians thirteen. Are you there? This is the Paul said this is the third time I am coming to you. Watch this. In the mouth of two or three witnesses. So two also means witness. Right? L shall every word be established? Now, Amplify says, This is the third time I am visiting you. Every fact shall be sustained and confirmed, watch this, by the testimony of two or three witnesses. So we got testimony, we got agreement, we got witnesses. See, Paul was quoting this verse right here. He was actually quoting that from Deuteronomy 19, verse 15. That's one of the that's one place he was quoting it from. Lando put that up there so they can see that this is one of the places where Paul was quoting this from as well. He says, One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin, and any sin that he sinneth, at the mouth of two witnesses, or at the mouth of three witnesses shall the matter be established. That's what Paul was just quoting in Second Corinthians 13. He was quoting Deuteronomy. Paul knew his Bible. He was like, I'm quoting, I'm quoting uh, what Deuteronomy said, what Moses said in Deuteronomy. So two is testimony, agreement, or witness. Now, when Christ sent forth his disciples, Christ didn't send, one thing about Jesus, he didn't send them out one. He, didn't, he never sent a person out by themselves. When Christ sent them out, go with me to Mark chapter 6, verse 7. That's one place it is, but this is just one instant where we can see what Jesus did. He called unto him the twelve and began to send them forth by two and two and gave them power over unclean spirits. So Jesus called the twelve and he sent them out 
two by two. He sent them out in pairs of two. There's something about that two. Jesus says two, two is protection. Two is a two also uh, is good for protection. Because when, when somebody bring an accusation against you, you know, you got somebody with you, they can and some they can help protect you, you know. That's why it, you know, uh preachers get in trouble when they counsel in the opposite sex by themselves. You know. Bring somebody else in there with you so that you keep the atmosphere clean. Keep you keep everybody you keep everybody honest then. Isn't that right? Uh, the, so we see this two here in this in this in this frame. We see this two a lot, but we look at it. We says, okay. In Revelation chapter three, verse fourteen, look at this. How y'all doing? Revelation chapter three, verse fourteen. Now we talking about this these boards. The scripture says about the second person of the Godhead. We know that the Godhead, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? The Father, the Son is the second person of the Godhead. Now, look what the scripture calls him. And unto the angel of the church of the layer of the sins, write these things, said the amen. Look what this calls him. The faithful and true witness. It calls the second person of the Godhead the faithful and true witness. So here in this framing of the tabernacle, we got the two. Why? Because he's the true witness. Right? So when we look at this thing here, he, he is the faithful witness, faithful and true witness. But, but the two here in this tabernacle, the significance of this thing is actually shown in a type here is the person of Christ Jesus, watch this, with two natures. Christ Jesus, the divine, Christ Jesus, the human. So Christ Jesus brings forth two natures. And we see this number two in this framing of the wood. Because why? See, that the wood was shittim wood, right? And it was overlaid with gold. And that's two elements right there, right? Gold and wood. So, so when we see this number two, it's showing the two natures of Christ, Jesus, the divine and the human. Now, it, it's, it's amazing because even in the Old Covenant, and the scripture was, when they was talking about the stones, you know, it called it the, the chief cornerstone. Just like these boards were in the corner, but in the old covenant they had in the corners they had cornerstones, and or they were called like coping stones. And you would put those cornerstones in the corner, and you would build the rest of the stones off of those. They were like the foundation. So when you look at First Peter chapter two, verse six, look at First Peter chapter two. Verse Peter 2, look at verse 6. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect and precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Look at Psalms 118, verse 22. So we see a cornerstone, we see corner boards. That's dealing with the foundation. Look, the stone which the builders refused, is become the headstone of the corner. They refused. They rejected him. Now, look at verse 23 and verse 24 of Exodus 26, verse 23 and 24. It says, The two boards shall thou make for the corners of the tabernacle in two sides. So these corners, these two boards for the corners of the tabernacle at the rear were on both sides. It's interesting that he tells them to put these two boards in the corners. Verse 24, and they shall be joined together underneath and joined together on top with one ring, 
so shall it be for both of them. They shall form the two rear corners. They shall form the two rear corners. It's pretty interesting because as, as we've studied this stuff, these boards uh, gave increased stability to the entire structure. See, these, that's why they put them boards right there in the corner, right there, because it gave increased stability to the whole structure when you added those two additional boards right there in the corner. See, and the corner, the corner boards or the cornerstone is presented as the foundation. So it's amazing how that the whole foundation or structure of this tabernacle was anchored by those two boards in the corners. Just like this cornerstone anchors the whole building, the foundation. So the whole strength of the building and the structure depended on the firmness of the foundational boards or the cornerstone, right? So it's so amazing because in the Old Covenant, uh, the, when they made the cornerstones, the other stones, they would cut them so that when you start cutting all the other stones off the off of the cornerstone, they would all connect together and compact together and and be perfectly right when you get to the other end. See, when you if you didn't cut in the corner, by the time you got to the other corner, you'd be off. So that's why they will put that stone in place, and then you will build every cut every other stone off of that. See, that's why the scriptures say we are lively stones, right? We are lively stones. And how, guess how we look? We are cut off of the cornerstone. So, so we have a perfect cut because we cut off of the cornerstone. That's the stone that was measured or used to cut all us. Lively stones. You know, you understand what I'm saying? So God laid the foundation in the death of his son. Now, he completed the building in his resurrection. Now, Let's look at these couplings. That's the uh, how he dis distributed them. He put 20 on each side. He put six on the back, and then he put two corner boards on those six. That's how they were distributed through this time. Now, let's look at these couplings uh, here in uh, verse 17. Exodus 26, 17. Let's look at these um uh, these um, couplings. Now it says, uh, two tenons shall there be in one board, or oh, tenons with like dovetails, uh, shall there be in one board. I'm going to talk about that word tenons in a minute. Hold on, just one second. Shall be in one board, set in order one against another. You see that? Fitting them together. Thus shalt thou make for all the boards of the tabernacle. So he says, you should make all of the boards. You should do the same for all the tabernacle boards. Make two dovetails in each board and fit them together. Do this for all of the boards of the tabernacle. Now, the Hebrew word tenons right there. The Hebrew word tenons. It also means, if you look it up, you can look actually look it up, baby, in your blue, the thing we use. You can, If you look up tenons, you'll see that another one of the meanings of tenons is also hands. Hands, H-A-N-D-S, hands. So <laughs> the Hebrew word means hands. So these hands held the boards and held them securely in place. They call them hands. You know, it's amazing because they what they do, what they present to me and you is a type of Christ Jesus, the God man, right? In his voluntary humiliation, and watch this, and he was dependent on and in subjection to the Father. Christ was constantly subjected to the Father as the perfect servant. Isn't that right? He was upheld, watch this. Christ Jesus was upheld 
and sustained, how? By the hand of God, the Father from above. He was upheld and sustained by the hand of God on him. Now, the Holy Spirit was ministering to him below while the Father's hand was on him from above. It's so amazing because go with me uh, to Psalms 80. Psalms 80. Look at Psalms 80 uh, verse. Let me tell you why I want to go. Psalms 80. Go with me verse 17. Psalms 80, verse 17. So those were the tenons, mean hands. It's interesting that the hands were on these boards, and these boards are Christ. So they put these tenons on top of these boards at the top. The, the tenons held these boards in place. But Scripture said the hands, and the shift on wood overlaid with gold was Christ, and that's the hand of the Father on Christ holding him in place. This tabernacle is, is very interesting. He says, let thy hand, look what it says. This is why it's tending. Let thy hand be upon the man of thy right hand, upon the son of man whom thou madest strong for thyself. Let thy hand be upon the man of thy right hand, upon the son of man whom thou madest strong by thyself. Let thy hand be upon him. That's the tenants. Look at Psalms uh, 31. Let me tell you where I want to go. Psalms 31. Look at verse 15. Hallelujah. Y'all okay? Listen to what he says. My times, where is where's, where's his times? In thy hand. He says, David says, my times are in thy hand. <laughs> Deliver me from the hand of my enemy. Because he says, look, my time is in your hand. So your hand is controlling my time. So you need to deliver me from the hand of my enemies because the enemy is trying to bring me under his time. He's trying to make me operate by his time clock. So my time is in your hand. So the enemy can't slow me down or speed me up because my time is in your hand. You control my destiny. He says, to get the enemy's hand off me because <laughs> he's trying to affect my time. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and from them that persecute me because they're trying to persecute me and slow my time down. See, God keeps us on, on, on point with his, with his time cycle. That's why he says, my times are in your hand. And because my times are in your hand, you move me along right on time, and nothing can move. So now he says, you got to deliver me from the hand of my enemy because they hand trying to come on me to move me from under your hand. So I'll get out of timing. Uh, see, God won't let us. See, if we stay true to God, he won't allow the enemy to take us out of timing. Because, see, God moves by times and seasons. The enemy is trying to throw something at us to to, to get us loose from God's hand, to get us out of his timing or his season so that we get out of sync with God's timing. And God says, no, I'm not going to let the enemy take my hand off of you so that you'll get off track. Thank God. That's what he says right here. My times are in your hands, so deliver me from the hand of the enemy who's trying to bring his hand on me to, to do something different than what your hand doing. <laughs> You know, uh, look at this here. Luke chapter 23. <laughs> Luke chapter 23, verse uh, 46. Remember Christ cried from the cross, Carolyn. You remember he said, look what he said when Jesus was on the cross. Look what he said. When Jesus had cried with a loud voice, listen, he's, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. I release my spirit into your hands because your hands been on me the whole time. Into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. And watch this. The hand of God took his spirit 
back to heaven. <laughs> he says, I'm releasing my spirit into your hands because your hands been the, the orchestrator the whole time. Wow. Now Christ seated at the, where he seated? Look at Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. He keeps saying the hand of God is, and I release my spirit in your hand. Your hand is upon me, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. He says, now I'm sitting on the right hand of the majesty on high. So these couplings or these tenons on top of these poles, holding these poles, is the hand of God on Christ. Are you with me? So we continually see the spiritual significance in all of the details of this tabernacle. This tabernacle is incredible when you take your time and go to it because everything points to Christ Jesus. Even the the tendons that hole in that, the silver and all of the silver sockets that were where the tabernacle, uh, the boards were sitting on the silver sockets on the ground. That's the, the foundation of redemption. The, the redemption holding the whole tabernacle in place because all of the board structures were sitting on silver sockets. That means the whole foundation of the tabernacle is resting on silver, which is redemption. Let's look at uh, let's look at some more. Can we look at some more? I got a few more minutes. Look at Exodus twenty six. <laughs> Exodus twenty six twenty six. Let's look there. And thou shalt make bars. Now we talking about bars. So we have. We got sockets. We don't saw sockets. We don't see tenons. We don't see boards. We don't saw corner boards. Now we see in bars. Is there all of this stuff on the tabernacle? Yeah. Most of the time you see a picture or a diagram of it, you don't see all this. A lot of times people don't even talk about all of this, this as much as detail as this. They don't talk about the main parts of it, but they don't really get into the detail, the bars around it and all that. Look at this here. That's why I say, well, we can do it. It's in the Bible. Let's go with the Bible. And thou shalt make bars of shittim wood. Five for the boards of the one side of the tabernacle and five bars for the boards of the other side of the tabernacle. Watch this. And five bars for the boards of the side of the tabernacle for the two sides westward. And the middle bar in the midst of the boards shall reach from one end to end, from end to end. And thou shalt overlay the, watch this, and thou shalt overlay the boards with gold and make the rings of gold for places for the bars. And thou shalt overlay the bars with gold. Let me read it. Let me read this from the Amplified for you. Then you shall make, um, watch this. Then shall you make 15 bars of acacia wood or shittim wood. Five for the boards of the one side of the tabernacle, five bars for the boards of the other side of the tabernacle, and five bars for the boards of the rear end of the tabernacle for the back wall toward the west. And the middle bar in the center of the board shall pass through horizontally from end to end. So you had five bars on the west side. You have five bars on the on on. On, one, on, on the west side, on the back, you had five on the north and five on the south. So you had 15 bars that went around this thing. And then you had one bar that went horizontal all the way down from the back to the front, from the front all the way to the back through the middle. That's what verse 29 says. In the middle bar, in the midst of the board, shall reach from end to end. You had one board that went right through the middle center of the uh, of the boards right from the front to the back. <laughs> the 
the bars were used to unite the boards together and hold them firmly and solidly in place. Now, you imagine the, these boards now. Picture these boards, and halfway up around these boards, you got these bars that are in, uh, so in, in these uh, so rings of gold all the way around these bars are holding or uh, halfway up these boards all the way around on the back side and on each side. And it's amazing because it says each of the boards ended at the bottom in two tenons which were seated into the two sockets of silver. And now the boards were held upright, right? And sustained and linked together by five bars of schistian wood overlaid with gold. The boards were held, sustained, and linked together. Now, it's amazing. Um, it says in verse 29 that these bars ran through rings or staples of gold inserted in the boards. Verse 29, it says, Thou shalt overlay the boards with gold and make rings of gold for places for the bars. So you had these uh, bars that ran through rings or, or like staples or rings of gold inserted in the boards. And it's amazing because that middle bar ran the whole length of the tabernacle, uniting all the 20 boards together. That one ran down the middle. He held all of the 20 on each side together. <laughs> it's, a, it's a massive structure here. Now, you had five bars well, on, the, on, on the north side. You had five bars on the south side and five on the rear. Ain't that what we read? But you had 48 boards total, right? Because you had you had the twenty, uh, you had the twenty and the twenty, right? That was forty. Then you had the six on the back. Then you had the two on the corners, right? So we have forty-eight boards. I know I'm throwing. A, this is. A, I hope this ain't boring y'all in the ground. This is a lot of stuff here. This is a lot of stuff. It's in the Bible. You just, it just got to You got to take your time and mess with it, and deal with it. So we have forty-eight boards total, right? But then you notice we have 15 bars. We have five bars going on each side. Five bars on the west, the west north side, five bars on the south side, and five bars on the west side, right? That's what it told us. But the, the, the question of these bars, what are all these bars? These bars serve to give unity to the structure. It was in it. Why? What did it do? It se securely linked and held the boards together. These bars. It was like a reinforcement going around the middle, so that the bar. Because if if you held it together with the uh, tenons and the silver socket, the, well, you had this in the middle. You had a lot of lo leverage, uh, free play there. So you stabilize it by middle way of it. You put these rings, and then you put these bars around it. It came an additional stability, uh, stabilizer. Isn't that right? So the bars serve to give unity, watch this, to the structure by securely linking the boards together. Now, the wooden boards that they were holding together were overlaid with gold, right? And that portrayed the two natures in Christ, right? So the boards, again, the boards, the 20 boards on each side and the six on the rear and the two on the corner, 848, the wooden boards overlaid with gold, they portray the two natures in Christ, the wood, Christ the man, the gold, Christ the divine son of God, the, the human and the divine in one person, right? But then these bars were held around them. What are these bars? They pointed to the perfect union between them. 
these bars pointed to the perfect union between these boards by holding them all in place so that they all was none of them were moving. The bars pointed to the perfect union between the two natures. <sighs> Isn't this something that Christ Jesus came? Though he came, look, he was God and man, our Savior, right? He was God and man in one as our Savior, right? But it's it's the powerful because watch this. Though God and man, our Savior, is is not two persons, but one. The God man. He was all in one. He was two in one. He didn't come as two different people. He came as the God man. Christ the man. That's why he was God in flesh. He says, I'm God and I'm I'm just as much God as I am man. But I'm not, I didn't come as two different entities. <sighs> you know, his two natures are totally distinct. Even though he came with two natures, his two, two natures were totally distinct. Because all truth being equal, his divine nature was holding him up and carrying him through all the punishment he took. Because his human nature wasn't strong and wasn't capable of carrying him through that type of anguish. It was his divine nature that was sustaining him and carrying him through what a human couldn't take. So his two natures are totally distinct, yet are his two natures perfectly and forever joined together. Even though they distinct, they two distinct natures, but they are perfectly and forever or eternally joined together. In other words, they always cooperate. Only one time we saw we saw uh, a separation try to take place in Gethsemane. You remember in Gethsemane? Where he began to say, "My soul is exceeding sorrowful," and and so forth, and then and, and and then that thing, that soul was trying to do something different, and he says, "Nevertheless, not as I will, but Thy will." You saw that 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 the human nature trying to separate from the God nature, but even then, he pulled it back in. He gave us an example when our flesh tried to pull us away from God. You got to reach out and grab him and pull him back into and make him submit to the supernatural divine nature of God that's in us. Don't let him run wild. When he try to do something different, we grab him and say, no, you don't, uh -uh, you're not going to do anything apart from what God wants. <laughs> Isn't that what Jesus did in Gethsemane? When his soul was exceeding sorrowful, his soul tried to, you know, if it, what did he say? If it be possible, let this cup pass. That, was, that, that thing was trying to, that, that human side of him was trying to run from that cross. See, the human side say, man, I, got, I got to go to the cross. The human side say, I know. is there a way to get out of this God? <laughs> See, that was his human side. Because what did he say? My soul is exceeding sorrowful. That's his human side. See, that part was trying to escape that cross. But watch this. The divine kicked in. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thy will. That was the divine talking. See, the divine had to kick in and say, uh-uh, you're not going to get away from this. He said, for this cause, I came in the world, and I am not going to let the flesh have an opportunity to take. See, that was, see that was, that's what he said earlier, what we just read. The, the hand, my hand, the hands are in, my times are in your hand. And he says, deliver me from my enemy. See, at that time, the body was trying to be, trying to, the soul was trying to take him away from that, what the times of God's hand on him. God, that thy times are in thy hand, was saying, you're going to the cross. But watch this. The soul says, I want to be an enemy to you now because I'm going to keep you from going to the cross. 
that's what he said, deliver me from my enemies, thy times, my, uh, uh, your hand, my, thy times, uh, my hand is, your hand is upon me and controlling my times. <sighs> wow. You know, these two natures, none of, none of us can say we uh, understand how they meet together or how they operate totally. It's a mystery. We just got to believe what he tells us. We don't understand how the Godhead functions. Anybody that say they know can 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 nail the Godhead down, they're crazy. I don't understand how they all can be one and, and be different and cooperate totally. None of us understand. We understand certain aspects of the Godhead. We limit it. Isn't that right? So it's significant because these bars which united the boars were themselves made of gold, of wood overlaid with gold. Even the bars was made out of the same thing the wood was made out of. The boards. The bars were made out of the same thing the boards were made of. It were, both were made of. So the bars uh, united the boards together. But watch this. But they were made of wood overlaid with gold as well. God says, I'm not going to bring something different in to leverage this thing. He says, everything going to be leveraged by these two natures. He said, my, these two natures are strong enough to hold everything together. So he says, even with the bars, I'm not even going to make them out of a different material. I'm going to show you the power of Christ's humanity because the bars were made of shit and wood overlaid with gold just like the boys they were holding up. That's unison. Everything was made of the same thing, and everything was holding each other in place. That's the, that's the unity of the God, of, of the God man. That's how perfectly Christ's humanity cooperated with his divinity. Perfect cooperation. Whew. Wow, man. Let me go to the veil. Can I go to the veil? I got a few minutes. Can I slip over? I, that's seven things about the boards I wanted you to know. I wanted you to know about the boards. I gave you seven things about them. I talked about, again, their materials. I talked about their dimensions. I talked about the sockets that was holding them. Uh, I talked about the, the meaning of the boards. I talked about how the boards were distributed. I talked about the couplings that held the boards together. And I talked about the bars that was around the boards. That's the boards. Let's go to the veil. The veil. Now, Exodus 26, verse 31. And thou shalt make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet and fine twine linen of cunning work. With cherubims shall it be made. You see that? Verse 32. And thou shalt hang it upon four pillars of shittim wood overlaid with gold. Their hooks shall be of gold upon the four sockets of silver. And thou shalt hang up the veil under the tashes that thou mayest bring in thither within the veil of the ark of the testimony. And the veil shall divide unto you between the holy place and the most holy. The holy place is the holy place. And the most holy is the, what we call the holiest of holies. Scripture says some places you call it the most holy and the holy place. But it's interesting because there's a lot here. It's going to take um, it's going to take me a several weeks to deal with this veil. But the tabernacle had three different components. Right, it, it was threefold division of the tabernacle. You had the outer court. You had the holy place, and you had the holiest of holies. You had the see God, God three in one, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Right, but then you have me and you. We are we have a body, we have a soul, and we we are a spirit. Right. Well, the outer courts is a type of the same thing. The outer court is like our body. The holy place is like our soul. 
because even in the holy place, you have the mind, emotions, and will. Right? That's why you got the table of showbread, the golden lampstand, and the altar of incense inside the holy place. The table of showbread was the word of God, right? The golden lampstand. And you had the altar of incense, right? Watch this. Stay on course. <laughs> it's so it's so easy. So we have the outer court, the holy place, and the holies of holy. In the in the holy place, you had the the table of showbread. That's the will. You had the golden lampstand. That's the mind. That's why Paul prayed the eyes of your understanding being enlightened and illuminated. That's your mind. The word of God that was on the table of showbread had the word. That's the will. The word of God is always his will. It's called his will. Isn't that right? The will of God. And then you had the third piece of furniture in there, the altar of incense, mind, you have the will, the mind, and and the emotions. You say, how does that fit the emotions? Well, watch this. When you begin to worship God and praise God and you, and get an intercession, you can f you, your emotions get tired in it because your human emotions kick in as well. But nowhere in the Bible do you ever see the word emotions. But we know it's there. But you never see that word in the Bible. You can't find it. Find it to find it. If somebody can find it for me, show me. I ain't never seen it. The word emotions is not in the Bible. Because God don't want us to move by them. Even though he gave them to us. He gave us emotions. But he don't, he don't, it, you don't find it in the Bible. Isn't that something? You remember, Jesus never told his disciples anything about operating by how they feel. You can't find one time, because God never commands our feelings and our emotions. He commands our will. Because he know God stayed away from that, because that's the part that will make us wishy-washy. Because the day we feel like it, and tomorrow we don't. God says, I'm not going to deal with you on your emotions because you, you will never get nothing done. Uh, in the holy place, yeah, you have the altar of incense in there. That's right before the veil. And you notice something. Uh, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. But you notice something in this, in this veil. You notice I read in verse uh, uh, 31, it had cherubims in it cherubims in this veil see this was the veil that separated the holiest of holies right and see this holiest of holies was separated by this veil and this veil was designed to keep sinful man out of the holy holiest of holies this veil kept sinful man out of there because he only even with the high priest only he could go in there once a year but he couldn't go in there with sin. He had to wash himself with blood. He had to kill the animal and change his clothes and all that. By the time he got to the veil to go in there, he was right. Because by if because he had to go in there and carry the blood on the behalf of the rest of the people. So he had to go in there right. So even he couldn't pass that veil with sin. Right? Isn't it interesting that God put these cherubims on this veil? This veil has the four colors. Uh, of, of the gospel on it, the blue, the purple, the scarlet, the veil, Jesus Christ came as a, a, as a man, right? Four offices. And, and it's so powerful that Christ Jesus, you remember when he was on the earth, when the devil was tempting him, and the, when the devil left him, what came, what happened? Angels came and ministered to him. 
angels always minister. When Christ came as a man, God sent angels, said he's going to need angels to be with him. In his four offices, that's why you see the cherubims on the veil. Because God says in his four offices, when he come as a man, in those four offices, he's going to need angels with him. That's why when that's why when Christ come in me and you as salvation, that's why Hebrews 1, 14 says, now we, they are ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those whose heir of salvation. So now that's why angels minister to me and you, not because of who we are. They, they recognize, they said Christ is in him now. We got to treat him right now. We got to minister on his behalf because he got that same Christ in him that we are on assignment for. So because Christ in me and you, now they ministering on our behalf. They follow in Christ. You remember, go a little step further. You remember in, in Genesis chapter 3. Go there with me. See, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but that's okay. Genesis chapter 3. You remember this right here? I'm going to show you this here. G Genesis 3, look at verse 24. Let me know when you're there. You'll notice when, when Adam got in sin, right? When Adam got in sin, God did something. Isn't that right? God did something to keep him out of the garden. Look what it says. So he drove out the man. Right? He drove out the man out the garden. Look. And he placed at the east of the garden what? Cherubims. Why did he put them there? Because he put them there so that sinful man could not come in, in the garden anymore. So that's why even at the veil that leads to the holiest of holies, God, that's the same concept right there. He says, I'm putting angels at this veil so that sinful man can't come in. <laughs> it's the same concept. Because why? Adam had gotten sin. And now angels were at the Garden of Eden gate blocking him and saying, no sinful man can pass this point. God put cherubims on the veil that leads to the Holy Spirit says, no sinful man can come to pass this point. <laughs> Only a man that that have been taken care of with sin. That's why, only, watch this, all of the other priests, could, all of them could come in the holy place. Oh, I mean, numerous priests came in there, but only one could go past the holies of holies, go into the holies of holies. Only one. rest of them stayed out there. Only the high priest could go further. And that, watch this, Aaron, and only once a year, did he do it? Aaron was the high priest, right? Aaron would go in once a year, carry their blood on the behalf of the people. But watch this. That's an Old Testament type of our high priest, Jesus Christ, who, watch this, who once and for all took his blood into the heavenly sanctuary on our behalf. And he did it one time. So now, watch this. The scripture says, the veil was torn in two when he did that. So now we got access in and out now because why? He was the one that all of these types and shadows right here was pointing to. It's because why? The, the veil had to stay up because the true sacrifice hadn't came yet. There was all types and shadows. So that veil could not be torn in two and taken out of the way until Christ came. He was the only one that could cause that. Once he's paid the price, through his sacrifice, that was the true sacrifice. All of them animals were types. Once he paid the sacrifice with himself, that veil was rent in two. God said, y'all got access now through him because he solidified this thing so that y'all can have access to me now. Because once you get saved, God says, you got access. But before that, 
the animals, and the scripture said the blood of bulls and goats couldn't do it. So the veil had to stay there, waiting on Christ. And Aaron, was a, the high priest, was a type of that. You know, look at, um, look at this here. I'm going a, I'm to a, I'm a shut down here in a minute. Look at this. I want to show you something real quick before I close. Look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. Hallelujah. I don't think I'm going to get, I'm going to just, I just might well just stop right here and just pick up the veil next week. It's amazing that that veil was, that veil was hanging there with those cherubims on it. And those priests, those priests that only could go in the holy place were just looking at that veil and saw them, looking at them angels and their vivid colors every, every time they go in there. And they and I wonder did it, it, it did their thoughts dawn that wow that that's what that would happen in Genesis. Those angels was 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 there right before the Garden of Eden to keep us from going into the presence of God after sin for man's sin, he was not allowed in the garden. But these priests says, Oh, God says you can't go in the holiest of holies. Because I got cherubims there right before you get in. And they're going to keep out the assignment to keep out everybody that's sinful. Now, Hebrews chapter 10, look at verse 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Verse 20. By a new, see that's old they were doing. By a new and living way, watch this, which he has consecrated for us. How? Through the veil. See? That is to say, his flesh. The veil was Christ's flesh. The veil that led to the holiest of holies was Christ's flesh. That's why, watch this, when, when, he went into the heaven with his blood. Look at Matthew chapter 27. I'm all over the place now. I know where I'm going, though. I'm just got away from my notes now. But look at, look at Matthew 27. I'm going to show you something. Look at this here. I'm going to show you. Are you there? Watch this. Matthew 27. Let me go over here to it. Look at verse uh, 50. When Jesus had cried again with a loud voice, he yielded up the ghost. Right? Verse 51. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain, or two. From top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks did rent. The rocks even split apart. But once Christ Jesus released his spirit into the Father's hand, at once the veil of the holiest of holies of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Why? The process was complete. This is what the veil was waiting for. When Jesus Christ gave up the ghost, the veil was torn. Why? God's plan was, was done then. He had paid that price of sacrifice that required that the, the veil was waiting for. And you know what's so powerful? The veil, Scripture said the veil was his flesh, right? They beat his flesh. They tore his flesh. They beat him, right? They beat and tore his flesh for sacrifice as a part of the sacrifice. So they beat and tore his flesh. 
Watch this. They tore his flesh, but when he released and gave up the ghost, the veil came online with what his body had took. When he when he released the ghost, uh, released his spirit, then the veil came in unison, and the veil said, just like his body was torn down, the veil came on you came online because that was his flesh that had been torn. So the veil tore right in two, just like his body was torn when he gave up the ghost. And he says, now y'all got access to the Father by my broken body and my releasing of my spirit to the Father. Y'all got access now. Now me and you can come boldly unto the throne of grace to obtain mercy and help to find in the time of need. Why? Because we can enter in boldly because he went in for us and opened the way for us. I'll talk, I'll pick up the veil because I'll pick up more on the veil and I'm going to show you a lot of more things about this veil. I ain't even touched it yet. But this veil is very powerful as well. And uh, then we'll go from the veil, uh, maybe take in over the next couple of weeks, we'll deal with the veil and then we'll go to the next piece of furniture. Hallelujah. Maybe somebody watching is not saved. And Jesus Christ is not the Lord of your life. Listen, Christ Jesus' body was broken for you. His blood was shed for you. The veil that led to the presence of God, the holiest of holies is where God dwells. No one can come in the presence of God with sin in our lives. We got to be born again. So the only way you can get to God is you got to go to his son. The redemptive plan he made when his body was broken and torn and he died and he rose again. You can be saved. You can you can reach the father. But you got to go through the veil of the flesh of his son that was broken and torn for your sins. His blood was shed for the remission of your sins. I want to give you that opportunity. If you're not saved in Jesus Christ, not the Lord of your life. Pray this prayer with me. And receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. Say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. I receive you as my Savior and my Lord. Take my life and use me to bring you glory. The Lord loves you and so do we. Thank you for praying that prayer. We are excited for you. The, the Bible said the angels in heaven are rejoicing over a soul or that a lost person that comes to the Lord Jesus Christ. So we thank God that you made that decision. There's a, a information about the ministry you can find on the website. Send us a message. If you, if you prayed that prayer and accepted the Lord, email us or go to the uh, Facebook page. Send us a message and let us know that you accepted Christ into your life so we can rejoice with you and continue to pray for you. We pray that you will come back and join us again. We'll be back on Wednesdays and also you can come uh, tune in on Sunday mornings at 930, 9.30. You can come. We have prayer. But then the service, actual worship service starts at 10.30. Uh, you can tune in uh, there or you can come be with us. We'd love to have you with us if you're in the Central Texas area. It's different watching it online versus being here. We'd love to see who you are, meet you, shake your hand, and greet you. Come out and be with us if you're in the area. We'd love to have you. So the next time we meet, God bless you. I pray you have a wonderful remaining of this week. And we'll see you next time. In Jesus' name, God bless you. Good night. Hallelujah.